No, I was trying to see if this worked. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you again for your talk. I'm going to change it up a little bit. Um, and Gift has been telling us about environmental contamination. And I'm going to talk about um, microbes and also microbes in the context of contamination and in the context of our urban areas. My name is Merito Ceda. I am a PhD student at the Department of Environmental Science. And yes, this is my talk. So thank you for coming. Um, and this all starts with me moving to Arizona um, three years ago. I moved all the way from Spain. And in that move, I had to find new places that I could call home. One of those places is Himmel Park. I think if you're from Tucson, you might be familiar with this, with this little cute park. I love sitting there. I love hanging out with my friends, reading a book, uh, watching the sunset. And something that I have started doing as an annoying scientist is thinking about the environment that surrounds me and specifically the soil and the microbes that inhabit it. Um, the microbes, as I have learned and I want to express now to you, are very important for sustaining the ecosystems that we live on. Specifically, I research terrestrial ecosystems and here microbes do everything that you can think of from maintaining the soil as it is to uh, giving nutrients to the plants that live on that soil. But the soil is not some Willy Wonka type party. Uh, the soil is actually war. And I'm gonna break it down to you. So the soil has limited resources. This, is, this cake over here is the resource. If you're a microbe living in the soil, you probably want to get the resource to survive and you have competition. So the first thing you're gonna do is try to eliminate your competitors using what we call antibiotics, anti-life. When you're a microbe B and you're just doing your life and some microbe A is trying to like kill you off, you're naturally going to try to defend yourself by creating what we call antibiotic resistant. All these things that we humans would do by learning, microbes do by creating genes for those. And the good thing about genes is that you can transmit them to your pals, you can send them off and make your friends also resistant to antibiotics in this case. So when I'm sitting there in the park, something that I have started to, be, to think about is how do we humans, because we humans take antibiotics, right? Everybody here has taken antibiotics at some point in their life. How does the ingestion of antibiotics and our usage of antibiotics affect this, the, anti the microbes that live in the soil? And can those affect us back? Can the resistance that is generated in the soil come back to us? And this is actually pretty important, especially nowadays, because every year more people live in cities. Uh, this is where I'm focusing my, my research in urban parks and every year, more and more people are moving to cities because that's where the jobs are and also the fun. Um, and also cities, <laughs> I'm a city girl, and also cities are more and more green every year. Uh, you can see here in, in everything that is not red is an urban park. And all I want you to see is a lot of non-red. So my question in my, one of the biggest questions in my PhD is how does urbanization, how do cities that we live in affects the resistance that, uh, that lives within the soils in the microbes? And to do that, I'm using three of my alter egos. I have more than these. My first one is my field, my field scientist alter ego. I go out in the field, collect the soils, then I go back in the lab, use my biologist's laboratory alter ego, and take the DNA out of those soils, all the DNA from every microorganism in that soil. And then my favorite alter ego, the one that you have seen the most of, those that know me, is my data science alter ego, in which I uh, take data files that contain the sequences of DNA from those microorganisms, and I try to find those genes that code for resistance for our antibiotics. Um, my, main, my main experiment takes place here in Tucson, in my favorite park and other parks. I have uh, data from um, areas in the, inside of the city, in urban parks, and also natural areas. Because I want to compare the urbanization effect to what, will be, what the natural environment without humans would look like. And so far, I have some results. So far, 
what I have seen is that the number of genes that code for antibiotic resistance is higher in urban parks, which I was kind of expecting. So in the next steps of my project, which is what I'm doing right now, what I want to know is what genes are those that I have that I'm seeing in that in that last plot, who like what microorganisms are carrying them, and are those genes that we should be concerned about? Can they come back to us? Can they be transferred to uh, microbes that give us disease? So essentially, my question is: When I'm sitting in Himo Park, am I sitting on a soil that could risk my health, or am I sitting on a gold mine for new drug discovery? Thank you very much. Is anyone missing a phone? Because this one was sitting in the front row. It's not turned on, so somebody was like really nice not having their ringer going. Great. <laughs> um, and then, are you clicking too? Or do I click the things? I click the things. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Chosen, do you want to go next? OK, great. I don't know, it's his. Um, so I've been chosen to speak next. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chosen. I'm a second year PhD student in the School of Plant Sciences here at the University of Arizona. And this evening, I want to talk to you, Pooh, about how plants respond to drought and heat stress. It's no longer news that our environment is changing, but have you ever paused to imagine how does the change in environment, specifically our climate, how does it impact plants? If this room is hot, some of us are simply going to go outside. If it's too cold, you put on your jacket like I saw my colleague doing. But have you ever imagined plants don't move around? So how do they mitigate the stress that come from climate change? There are a lot of impacts that climate change have on our environment. Um, such as droughts, increasing CO2, increasing sea level, amongst other challenges. And all of these different impacts have three broad impacts on agriculture. One, in areas that are used to being dry, if all of a sudden there is increase in rain, it could favor disease vectors, which would lead to uh, disease severity. Um, it also leads to lower yield and also reduction in nutrients of some plants. And you're imagining, so how do plants cope with all of this stress? There are different strategies that plants have employed. But I'd like to talk to you about the impact that climate change poses on yield first. This map you're looking at, it's a map that shows different parts of the world. A research that was done a few years ago looking at the impact that climate change would have on crop yield assuming that we maintain the current tools we have in agriculture. And the areas that are in red specifically tells you that these areas will be greatly more impacted by change in our climate. And the areas that are green, you can see the US up there, and also you know, Europe and Canada, that you know, it's uh, predicted that there'll be an increase in production in those areas. And I'd like you to keep this map in mind because we're going to come back to this. So how do plants mitigate all of this stress? There are different ways they do it. We have the above ground examples and below ground examples. And these are some plants that you would be familiar with if you live in Tucson. Um, you might have seen the cactus, the soiros, and you see all of the, the spikes. You might think, oh, this, this, uh, this, no. You can just imagine, why do these plants have this? The answer to it is that the plants are using the spikes to protect themselves from animals that can eat them up. There are also some of the soirets that don't have leaves are because they want to reduce the rate of transpiration in order to conserve more water. And also, if you look at the below ground characteristics, some of them have tubers, and some of them grow the roots down in order to assess different um, water level. So you look at all of this phenotype, 
The first question I'm asking in my research is what are the genetic players that controls all of these phenotypes we see? And the second question is how does drought and heat stress affect plants phenotypically? And to answer this research question, I've chosen an important cereal that is called sorghum. Some of you might have not heard about sorghum, but I'd love to tell you about sorghum today. It's the fifth most important cereal in the world. And you know, you can ask, why choose sorghum? I already mentioned, it's the fifth most important cereal. Number two is that here in the US, sorghum is high in starch. So it has the basic requirements to be processed into biofuel. But beyond that, it's the staple dietary crop for over 500 million people in the world. And this is about 500 times the population of Tucson. Here are some products that you can get from sorghum. You have flour that you can use for baking. It's gluten-free. And also some people from some part of Africa prepare sorghum in form of porridge and just enjoy it with fruits. So how do I answer my research question? And some of these areas are the areas where sorghum is largely consumed. How do I answer my research question? I've collected different sorghum varieties from around the world, specifically here in Nigeria, where I'm from, from South Africa, and here in the US. In total, I have six different varieties. And I'm growing this sorghum here in Tucson at a place that is called Maricopa, that is just about 18 miles from Tucson. And the climate in Maricopa gives us an opportunity to be able to have the climate that we predict we'll have in the future. If you've been here in the summer, you would understand this. And I use different approaches in my research. Genetics, just I want you to think about it as the internal one. And then phenotyping, this looks at the um, external part. And combining these two different approaches, I'm able to tell what is the phenotypic response of the different assertions of sorghum that I study. And beyond that, what is the genetic makeup, the mechanism that controls the phenotypic responses that we're seeing? And one of the things that enables my research is this big um, robot that is called the gantry system. And I wanted to think of the gantry system as a big robot that is equipped with different cameras that helps us to be able to study each and every plant, thousands of plants that we have in the field. And the gantry system helps us to be able to get data such as the plant size, the temperature of the plant, the water use efficiency, and also the overall topological feature of the plant. And when we combine this data with the genetic data, we're able to get a good insight to how plants are responding to drought in the field. With this data, we're able to determine one, which is the best performing varieties of sorghum that I've collected from around the world that we can use in breeding programs. Beyond this, I also want to understand the mechanism behind this so that we can be able to engineer crops for the future. And beyond that, the overall goal of my research is to be able to develop crops that withstand the changing climate, such as farmers like this man in Tanzania who grows sorghum can go to the field smiling, irrespective of the season and irrespective of the changing climate. Thank you. We're doing some finagling. That one's fine. Can I just do it myself? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for sticking with us thus far. My name is Rebecca Bland. I'm a PhD student here at the university in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. 
and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research on plants and microbes in a changing planet, going back to the microbe world. Oh, okay, great. Okay, go back. <laughs> All right, so I would like for you to close your eyes for a moment and imagine, if you will, a small red berry. It's covered in golden sparkles, looks like it's been dipped in glitter. And you put it in your mouth, and it's very sour, but in the middle, it's sweet and soft. You've just tasted an autumn olive, and you can open your eyes now. Is this what you imagined? It might be, because you just saw the picture of it. But this is an autumn olive. Well, the last time that I tasted an autumn olive was walking around the pond at the Episcopal Church of the Advocate in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And we were discussing how best to steward this land as a religious community, and as a result, how to get rid of the autumn olive shrubs. Because autumn olive is an invasive plant in the eastern United States, quickly overtaking bare ground and leaving little to no room for the native plant counterparts. As one of the ecological experts in this scene, as well as a community member, I found myself at a little bit of an emotional in-between because Truly, getting rid of the autumn olive was what was best for the biodiversity and health of this surrounding ecosystem. But also, I really loved the individual plants with their funny little forest fruits and their gold-flecked leaves. Living in this complexity of emotions has led me to study invasive plants, to ask questions of what makes these species so invasive and how we as humans have grown to categorize them that way and also ask questions of what allows these species to gain such a strong foothold in ecosystems that sparks such strong and sometimes conflicting emotions. Now, you may not have heard of an autumn olive before today, but it's native to Eastern Asia, where it's used uh, as, a, as a fruit, um, as well as habitat for wildlife. Or you may have heard of buffel grass, which is very common around here. It's an invasive that was introduced from Africa and the Middle East, where it's used as a hay or as forage for cattle. The Himalayan blackberry, there it is, um, is a big problem in the Pacific Northwest of this country. Um, it's from Armenia, where it is, no surprises, a delicious berry, um, and also is used in traditional medicine. And then lastly, we have yellow star thistle, which you can't quite see the title, but yellow star thistle is native to the Mediterranean, where its name is used as an insult, and it's like, oh, you look like a yellow star thistle, you're so ugly. Um, all that is to say that each of these plants are not necessarily bad plants. They're all plants that have important roles in their native ecosystems, in their native communities, um, and have important purposes, but it's when we take them into new places that we start to get a problem. So what is an invasive species? Well, it's a plant or an animal that has been taken from its native ecosystem where it naturally occurs and brought into a new location where it gains such a strong foothold that it pushes out the native plant or animal community. So how do they get there? There's a few different ways. One option is purposeful, like for the, uh, the autumn olive and the buffel grass were both brought purposefully for specific reasons. Or it could be for fun, like the Himalayan blackberry was brought over because it's delicious or it could be by accident, like the yellow star thistle. And what allows these species to be so extra successful? There's a few different reasons, and it can be a combination of them all, and I also haven't listed them all, but sometimes it's surprising defenses. <laughs> sometimes it's surprising defenses. These species, comes with, these species come with um, new defenses and advantages that they're able to capitalize in this new ecosystem. Sometimes they could have a lot of offspring really quickly and the population can grow really fast. Sometimes they have predators or pathogens in the native ecosystem that keep the population in check, but those predators and pathogens don't exist in the place that those species have been brought to, and so the populations grow wildly out of control. And also in a lot of cases, we really just don't know. And that's at the base of what I study, is this we don't know question. So back to the ugly plant, this is yellow star thistle, which is the one that I particularly study. Um, it was introduced to the Americas in the 1800s from the Mediterranean as a contaminant of alfalfa, so by accident. And since then it has wreaked havoc in California rangelands, a bit in Arizona, a bit in the Pacific Northwest. Um, cattle don't eat it, it makes horses sick. And a single plant like this can produce hundreds of thousands of seeds. And we don't really 
fully know what makes this plant so successful and so invasive. And so that's what I study. So we, so I take above ground ecosystem wide disturbances, like say this fire or maybe a storm or um, species loss or um, extinction, but in this case, this fire. And I look at how this fire affects the little guys that Mary was mentioning in the dirt, the soil microbiome, the bacteria and fungi that exist in the soil. And I look at how that then affects the yellow star thistle. And we know that this soil microbiome from previous research, we know that this soil microbiome both helps and hurts plants that exist, but we're still trying to figure out how exactly it affects star thistle. So I look at this one particular fire. This is California. If you're not familiar, we have San Francisco in the northern part of the state, Los Angeles in the southern part of the state. And along this eastern border, we have a range of mountains called the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And so I look at how this one fire in 2021, the Caldor fire, um, how this one fire has affected yellow star thistle that's just beginning to grow up in those mountains and expand its range where it exists. So this fire burned for over two months. It covered 346 square miles, which is about one and a half times the size of Tucson. And I take soils that were burned by this fire. Um, as you can see on the left, I made some nice circles to show where I actually took my soil samples from. I'm not entirely sure if you can see them though, but I take soil samples from areas that were burned by this fire on the left and then areas that were unburned by this fire on the right. And I bring those soils back to our greenhouses here in Tucson and I grow yellow star thistle in them. And in doing so, I hope to gain information about how that fire and the not burned fire or the not burned area have been affected by that fire in the soil microbiome and then how that affects the growth of yellow star thistle. But I find that as I grow these plants from seeds and I put them in little petri dishes and I check in on them every day and I see their new leaves unfurl and they sprout and they're cute and their roots grow longer, I fall back into that emotional in-between of loving a plant that I know creates such unhealthy ecosystems here in this country. It's just like the rest of these. They're just plants that are out of place, but they also won't leave. Thanks. All right, perfect. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, one of my favorite parts about living in Arizona has always been these absolutely amazing sunsets that we get almost every night. But when you look up at the sky at night, have you ever wondered why they're so vibrant? It actually has to do with all the dust that we have. So dust is a type of large aerosol particle, and an aerosol particle is a solid or a liquid that's enveloped by a gas. And there are thousands and thousands of these in the air at any given time. They come in a wide range of shapes and sizes, but they're generally one tenth as thick as a strand of your hair, which is essentially the size of a red blood cell. Particles, especially larger ones, they scatter light that comes from the sun. And then the angle of the sun relative to the surface of the earth changes what colors we see. And therefore we get these really, really colorful, beautiful sunsets. In Arizona, we do have a lot of dust from natural sources, but also from industrial sources like mining. And then our neighbor, California, has two other types of large aerosol particles, one being smoke from wildfires and also sea salt. All of these different particles can cause a bunch of different issues, one being health issues. Because they're so small, they can easily be breathed in and deposit in our lungs and can even enter our bloodstream. They can cause air quality and visibility issues, and they can also affect cloud formation and the warming or cooling of the planet. My name is Kira Zeider, and I am a third year PhD student here at the U of A, and I am studying uh, chemical engineering. In, in particular, my research focuses on the interactions between aerosols, clouds, and meteorology, which are things like climate and weather, and looking at how they interact in the natural environment. 
it's important to understand how these all work together, not only in the environment, but also how we can model them together and accurately. But you may be wondering why do these interactions and why even do aerosols matter? One of the main reasons comes from the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is a United Nations body that assesses the science behind climate change. And every six to seven years, they put out a report that informs all of the governments around the world on the current state of knowledge with respect to climate change. And for the past couple of different reports, the IPCC has shown that aerosols, when compared to all of these other factors, have the largest uncertainty when it comes to the influence they have on the changing global temperature. So it's our job as researchers to do more investigations to understand more about the aerosols and their interactions, but also reduce that uncertainty. So as part of any good investigation, you need to have multiple forms of uh, approach. And I've been really fortunate with my research to have two different forms of doing research. And the first is with the use of planes, like you see here. So we take a couple of planes and then we completely gut them out. So there's no chairs, nothing. And we fill them up with a bunch of different instruments. So many that basically only two scientists can fit on board as well as one pilot. And then we fly these around for hours at a time and collect tons and tons of data. And one such uh, project that I'm doing using planes comes to look at wildfires in Cal California, and in particular, the wildfires in 2020. So here's just a map of all the wildfires that have occurred in California since the 1970s, colored by decade. And then this next image is gonna show just the wildfires that took place in 2020. I just think it's really powerful to have these two images right after one another, just to see how widespread and devastating just the fires in 2020 were. And while wildfires, absolutely, they can change the composition of clouds and the atmosphere, it's also important as a health perspective because smoke affects the health of not only humans, but animals and plants as well. So it's important that we understand how smoke changes and evolves when it's in the atmosphere, but also as it travels from California to even Arizona. So that way governments can be informed and they can create proper procedures and precautions so that they, we can be safe whenever another wildfire happens, which it absolutely will. So with planes, we can gather a bunch of data pretty quickly, and we can do a bunch of different types of analyses with that data in a pretty quick amount of time. However, you can't fly a plane every single day, and it's pretty expensive. So we need another form of doing research that's definitely a little bit more cost effective, even if it means it takes a little bit longer to do than just fly a plane for a couple of hours, and it gives us less data that we can do less analysis with, but we can repeat it more often. And that's where my research on the ground comes into play. This is community-based research where community members are actually trained to collect information that we later analyze. And in many instances, the communities that are participating are what we call fence line communities or towns that actually are the, in their, their backyards are these industries. And they're very concerned about their health with respect to air, water, and soil. And that is a big problem in Arizona because as you can see on this map, we have tons and tons of mines. And that is what motivated my other project. So we went into a town where this community had been growing some plants and they actually collected leaf samples for us. So what I did was I took their leaf samples and I looked at the dust that actually collected on these leaves and I looked at the toxic and non-toxic components in that dust. And eventually what I found was that these plants, just a little peppermint plant in somebody's backyard could actually be used to monitor air quality in these communities. And while it's important for us to understand and take data on whatever products and pollution are coming from certain industries, it's also really important to think about those communities that are on the front line and that are getting potentially all these pollutants and that are concerned about their health, rightfully so. So it's important that we as researchers find ways to monitor this air quality, but also give them the tools and empower them for them to take their health into their own, in, into their own hands and have that sense of safety. So when I look at a sunset now, I'm not only reminded of all the work that I've done in the sky and on the ground, but all the work that I still have left to do, as well as other researchers in my field as well. But even beyond that, when I stop and look up at the sky at night, I still just stop and admire a sunset for the natural beauty that it has. Thank you so much.
All right, hi everyone. Um, so the home or the house that is pictured on this title slide may look very similar to your own home, windows, doors, walls, but there's a distinguishing characteristic to this home, which uh, is a blue tarp that's on it. And so today I'll be talking about blue roofs and blue pixels and how these blue tarps are a physical reminder of long-term ongoing delayed recovery that a lot of people along the Gulf Coast are encountering after massive hurricane events. So I wanna take you to the city of Lake Charles, which is located in Calcasieu Parish in Southwest Louisiana. And in the fall of 2020, Lake Charles was hit by two category four hurricanes, Lake uh, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta, which occurred about five weeks apart from one another. And these two massive hurricane events are really a bellwether for what climate change has in store for the Gulf Coast with these large hurricane events um, bringing more wind and rain events um, to the Gulf. So Hurricane Laura alone uh, severely damaged or destroyed about an estimated 50% of the total housing stock in Calcasieu Parish, um, which is really significant. Um, and having that much housing come offline within a matter of a couple of hours um, has had really large implications for the community in Lake Charles. So after these large storm events, if your home is still standing, um, if and your roof is damaged, uh, residents or organizations will install tarps that are typically on homes uh, to prevent further water damage. And the tarps essentially act as a Band-Aid until contractors can come out um, and repair the homes or residents can get the funds together to repair their home. And you would think that they only last for a couple of weeks or months, but they end up staying on for what are years now. Um, these photos that I took of Lake Charles or some homes in Lake Charles were from last summer. So this was about two years after the actual storm events, um, which just is a signal of the ongoing um, recovery efforts that are happening uh, for these particular households. So the tarps are so striking that they can even be seen from space, um, which is shown with this photo, um, which is taken with a planet scope sensor. Um, that is from North Lake Charles that was taken about two months after the hurricane events. So each little individual kind of cluster of blue pixels that you see is an individual home with a tarp on it. And I use satellite imagery like this in my research to create uh, deep learning and machine learning models that can automatically detect uh, these blue tarps on homes. And it can do that with every single image that is collected with the planet scope sensor to see how long the tarps remain on um, in time. So um, if we look at a photo from this past January, which is almost two and a half years after the hurricanes, what's really striking with this is that a lot of the tarps have been removed, but there's still a decent amount that are still being detected or on, on homes. Um, and what's also really kind of uh, Fascinating with this is that the longer that the tarps are on homes exposed to different elements, they be also become harder to detect with satellite imagery. So there's this kind of decay process that's happening with um, our ability to actually detect tarps over time. So um, you can take this imagery and summarize it into essentially counts that are happening um, or counts of, of tarps um, with tarps being installed in the fall of 2020. So after Hurricane Laura, we see this kind of massive uptake in, in tarps that are being installed in Calcasieu Parish. Delta hits and more tarps are installed. And then with this time series of imagery through time, I'm looking at how, um, if the tarps are removed, when that's happening, and how this varies across neighborhoods um, in Lake Charles, which is really important for understanding differential recovery patterns that are happening um, across the city and across the parish. So you can imagine a hypothetical scenario of neighborhood A, most of their tarps um, are still on almost two and a half years later. But if we look at B and C, there's a bigger drop off in the tarps being taken off um, sooner, which can be really valuable for understanding which neighborhoods to prioritize for more immediate recovery efforts um, two years afterwards. 
Um, so beyond the novelty of mapping recovery from space, um, this is really valuable for understanding which homes are vulnerable and exposed um, for future storm events. So a uh, home that still has a tarp on it isn't structurally sound. And so when the next hurricane hits, which is really a question of um, this is, you know, these are homes that are kind of on the front lines of being even further damaged um, when the next storm strikes. But of course, recovery from space um, is just one angle of looking at and understanding recovery. So I partner with a group called the Disaster Justice Network. Um, that is a group of volunteers um, based in Louisiana that distribute resources and materials uh, to residents about um, building back in a way that is more resilient for hurricanes. So there's different techniques and materials that you can use on your roof um, to essentially hurricane proof your, your roof and home so it's um, more fortified against future storm events. So this is an example of um, resilient rebuilding where you can actually, um, you know, bring different materials together that are, are stronger and, and more fortified for, for wind. Um, and this is a picture of a demo that DJN, the Disaster Justice Network, is using to um, educate residents about these techniques. And so I want to end with this one picture of a, a yard sign that I took in Lake Charles that says, we will rise again. And kind of reflecting on what the topic of the, the, all of my um, colleagues' theme or talks were tonight for the theme was, was picturing the invisible. Um, I really try to focus in my research about how to bring or keep the spotlight on the recovery that a lot of these communities are facing in Lake Charles, um, because our ability to understand and detect recovery is becoming harder and harder the longer that time goes on with, with satellite imagery. And the attention shifts. The, there's a new disaster that happens, and um, efforts and attention go to that next event. So, um, trying to to keep the spotlight on what's happening in Lake Charles is, is really the the motivating focus for my research. Um, so yeah, and there, and uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. How about another round of applause for all six of our presenters today? And I think we definitely have time for a few questions. I'm not sure the food is here yet and ready. So, um, OK, it is here. I still want you to ask some questions. I wasn't hoping to be informed of the fact that the food was actually here. I thought it was a little white lie that would just work. Are there questions for any of our six presenters today, our Carson Scholars? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you, all of you who gave those great talks. Uh, my question is for Hannah. I was curious about um, the the process you must have to go through for differentiating other blue objects on the ground, like maybe water, bodies of water. Um, I don't know if that would be like the same blue color, but I'm just thinking um, maybe there's some differentiation you have to do there. Thanks. I will bring the microphone to you. Yeah, that's a great question um, because pools look blue, there's blue tennis courts, there's a lot of features on the landscape that could be um, confounded with blue tarps. So um, I part of um, collecting the imagery is creating training data um, that validates essentially like drawing little squares on high resolution satellite imagery to pick out blue tarps. Um, and given the, the different qualities of the imagery, um, without going into too much detail, there's different wavelengths in the imagery. So water will have a very different wavelength signature compared to a blue tarp so um, you can kind of leverage the different aspects of the imagery wavelengths and the model will kind of learn okay based off this training data that's a blue tarp this has a particular signature 
which doesn't match with this other blue thing on the ground, which may be a pool or something like that. So um, kind of a combination of um, modeling techniques and also having that training data to help it. Great, thank you. Another question. We can't have just one of our six put on the hot seat. All right, here goes number two. Hi, um, God Skiff, my question is for you. Great job, you did great. Um, so my question for you is, well, first I, I liked your presentation and I really liked the community aspect and how you're involving the community. My question is when you give them the results back, like in the books, like you were talking about, what is kind of the follow-up after that? Because obviously if you provide the information to someone that the water that they've been consuming is toxic, et cetera, what you were talking about, what, like, what do they do then? You know, I think about the ethics with that. Um, so yeah, I was just curious. Great, we have a second microphone, Gift. Um, thank you so much for your question. Um, most of the data sharing we do is to help people be aware of what is in their water. And then when we go back to do the data, um, the community events, we sort of, my boss so, um, and we, the team, we sort of talk to them about what they can be doing to protect themselves. And so if you have, say, high levels of lead in your water, we can tell you to like maybe find alternative sources of water or install a water filter or something to help you protect yourself. Um, there's very little we can do systemically to change like how much contamination you're exposed to. But individually, we help you be aware of what diseases potentially you might be exposed to and how you can take steps to reduce your exposures. Great, thank you. Other questions? Oh, a couple in the back here. Uh-oh, now the dam is broken. Okay, I have a question for Chosen. Thank you um, all for your great talks. This has been really enjoyable. I'm curious, given what you know about sorghum and how it's responding to drought and heat stress, what do you think are some of the best solutions for dealing with agriculture in a drying and hotter climate? I know that's a huge question, but just maybe a couple of things that you've learned through your research that would, would help us here in Arizona, for example. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is a really good question. I want to start off by saying that um, all plants at this point are endangered by the changing climates and how we manage it, it's key. Uh, one of the reasons why I study sorghum is that it's a C for plants. To put this in a very simple term is that it's able to use less water actually compared to like other cereals. Um, so one of the goals uh, is that if we're able to unravel some of the genetic mechanisms that help sorghum to do well, then we can do you know a simple study looking at other cereals and look at autologs, basically, can we transfer what we've learned in sorghum to these other series like rice and maize? Um, this is one, one example. Um, the other is, uh, you know, being conscious of the fact that water is a scarce commodity. And when I go to Maricopa, I see the way that the water is managed. And even in my home as a scientist studying drought and all of that, one of the days my wife was running the water and I was telling her, oh, this is enough, this is enough. And this has just made me uh, you know, so conscious of the environment. Um, so there are so many things we can do and um, sorghum as um, a template and learning what we can then apply to other crops. Hi, um, this question is for Mary. I'm curious about the antibiotic responses in microbes in urban soils. You're going to explore positives and negatives or, you know, benefits and detriments. And I'm curious, could you expand on that? What area? I mean, that is so broad. I'm curious of how you're going to hone in on that. Yes, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so at this point in my research, I mostly just do data analysis. I mostly just um, 
find from all the sequences of DNA of these microbes uh, what genes belong to uh, antibiotic resistance. So <clears throat> using a strictly um, informatic techniques, we can uh, find what are the microbes that are carrying those, those genes. And we can also, um, so we link them to the host and we can also compare them to the antibiotics that uh, we are using to kind of uh, try to understand if um, our usage of antibiotics is what is causing that increase in the in the number of genes, or if maybe it's some other um, some other source such as um, soils when when they have more different species and more number of bacteria, they become more competitive, right? So there could be that it could be the case that they're just a more like a bigger war zone than other soils, basically, to put it back into my analogy. Um, but yeah, so basically, trying to answer your question, we look for the genes and then we try to see what are the microbes that carry those genes. And if those microbes appear in things like plasmids, which are uh, sequences of DNA can, that can be uh, shared by other microbes, we can detect whether they would be potentially uh, transferred to other microbes and uh, those microbes could uh, be like pathogenic to us. So it's all that I do is with a computer, but obviously that is just kind of setting, creating hypothesis to then test it in like the lab and seeing if that, uh, you first create the hypothesis and then you validate it using like the Petri dish and all that. Yeah, thank you. Other questions? Yes. This is for Kira. Um, what were the, did you see anything on the leaves with particular elements that were there that were important, like chemically? So yeah, we, from what I can remember, there were things like arsenic and lead that Gift also talked about because Gift and I, we kind of both work in these fence line communities, so we have similar things, so yeah, lead and arsenic were some of them but also zinc surprisingly and even though we were you know adjacent to a copper mine in this community there wasn't as much copper as compared to these other elements which can bring into question other practices because another big practice in arizona is agriculture and there's a lot of abandoned agriculture fields so it just kind of brought us into more questions of okay so which um, of these elements are coming from local sources like this mine, but what are some maybe long range sources too that can be um, contributing to have, having some of these amounts. But yeah, those main ones would be the same ones that Gif talked about in her presentation as well. Thank you. Other questions? Any questions from within the six of you? Do you have questions for each other that you haven't answered yet? No. <laughs> All right, we won't we won't prolong the pain. Let me let me show just a couple of slides that we had up front. But first, I'm I'm always so excited to see these talks and and see the breadth of work that's going on on campus. See that these students are getting to work with each other and know a little bit about these different disciplines. But that also this is the future of of science communication and solutions. So another round of applause, please, for for these. Fabulous graduate students. I want to acknowledge a few folks. Um, Rachel Zollinger, Ariana Solwell, and Maya Schneider are uh, staff who have been supporting this program now in the past and into the future. And going forward, we, we had our picture the invisible tiny talks big impacts. Coming up on Wednesday, we have science at scale. Uh, there's still small talks and still big impacts, but um, there's less microbes. So please join us. Am I right about that? I think so. Please join us again, same time, same place on Wednesday as well. We also have on Wednesday morning, if you're interested, as part of Earth Week, we have a strategic plan in action event in here at 1015 talking about the Arizona Institute for Resilience and what AIR has done with the strategic investment 
um, strategic plan investment funds that have been put into AIR to launch these programs, support these kinds of programs. So please come and hear about the diversity of things that we're doing. Uh, you can look at the calendar on the AIR website for more details. And uh, if you were here for the, the keynote uh, talk, you heard a little bit about the schedule, but again, check out the Earth Week schedule. There's lots of great stuff going on all week. The SEAS groups, uh, the SEAS constituent departments and units uh, represents a fabulous diversity of um, research, teaching, and community engagement across campus. So we encourage you to take advantage of things happening this week. And with that, please come join us outside where the weather is nice, the food is free, and the music will start soon.